<clears throat> All right, uh, today we're working on experiment A. Um, we're not going to do all of it. We're going to do three parts of it. Thursday, we're starting experiment. What experiment are we starting on Thursday? One B. The lab schedule is going to stay fixed, uh, no matter where we are in lecture. You know, the lecture schedule is going to be. Sometimes we're on schedule, sometimes we're off schedule, but we're never going to be off schedule for the labs. <coughs> because of the equipment and everything else, the labs have to be set up for each specific lab. And so we can't go off schedule. Lab. You can stay if you want and see what happens. Or you can come at the end, either, if you got your other plan. All right, experiment 1B, I want to talk about that one. Because today's experiment, you don't need your lab notebook. How many people have purchased their lab notebook already? Well, um, most of you. OK, that's good. Um, now for the lab, you're going to need the, the quad ruled notebook. And so we might as well do this. Uh, today, uh, notebook is optional. Actually, uh, notebook, um, we're not going to use it. Let's uh, start with experiment 1B, which is Thursday's lab. Um, today we don't need goggles. Thursday we do need goggles. Thursday we also need uh, closed toe shoes, you know, no sandals. Experiment 1B, <coughs> um, here we're going to need the notebook. And the notebook is the quad ruled, sewn bound. Notebook. I want a sewn binding because I don't want you to tear out any pages. It's considered poor technique to remove pages out of your lab notebook. If you do make a mistake, let's say, you know, um, I made a mistake, just X out the whole page. You don't make it illegible because people want to see, you know, the numbers or the observations under that mistake. And so just leave it legible, just X it out and leave the page in there. Don't rip out any pages out of your lab notebook. All right, for your lab notebook, um, you're going to have to save some space. And so uh, I would write, you know, you have a choice. You can write on both sides of the page or one side of the page. We'll have plenty of pages. And so normally what people do is they just write on one side of the page, and then they scribble notes or whatever else, drawings, on the opposite side that they don't really collect or do calculations or analysis. <clears throat> and so we'll just... Um, do the single-sided. Page one, I'd like you to just reserve for table of contents. At the end of the semester, we'll fill in the table, but leave it blank for now. So the first page, leave blank. One page should be enough for the table of contents. You could leave two pages, it's fine. Decide to use this notebook for Chem 1B as well. OK, on page two or three, we're going to start experiment 1B. And so we'll need a title. The title for this lab is sulfate analysis. Yeah. What we're doing right now is called the pre-lab. For the pre-lab, you need to read through the experiment and then just prepare some of the procedure. This is the three-day lab, so you just prepare part of the procedure. It says, you know, go up to here for day one, something like that. Then we write a purpose. Everybody should know what the purpose of each lab is before starting the day. In fact, a very common pre-lab question at UCLA was, uh, what is the purpose of today's lab? People, you know, people often got that one wrong, but they only missed it once. The purpose of this lab is, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to determine sulfate content in 
an unknown solid. And so there's a, some unknown solid. Actually, what's unknown about it is we don't know how much sulfate's in there. And I, 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 other stuff we don't know as well. But determinant uh, sulfate content in an unknown solid. That's our purpose. And then uh, typically what we'll do is we'll divide the, the page, the vertical column here. Uh, we'll have the first two-thirds, we write procedure. The second um, column, we write observations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Procedure is what you do before the lab. You write out the procedure. What's the difference between procedure and observation? Well, procedure is the list of uh, laboratory instructions. And so you have different options here. One, you could just rewrite the instructions here, but that's not very useful because you have your lab manual. In, other, uh, in order to save time, you shouldn't rewrite it. You should just kind of hit the key points. Um, you need this right here, or you need that right there. You, you want to eliminate all the details so you can work quickly in the lab. In fact, what a lot of people do is they just do little drawings. You know, for example, uh, they'll draw out the unknown sample here, and so we obtain an unknown sample. And one of the first things we, we need to do is uh, we need the unknown number. So, you, unknown number, you, you need to get that. You can write that in your observations. It's unknown number fifteen, something like that. You know, but we want to write more than that because it's just some unknown solid, but we can see some certain things about this unknown solid. For example, you know, what color is the unknown solid? Well, it, it turns out you, you guys are going to have white powder. Everybody's going to have a white powder for the unknown solid. This unknown solid should be a dry. In something called a weighing bottle. Weighing bottles are very expensive. Um, it's just a, a glass jar that has a lid on it, a glass lid like this. And it's expensive because the joint between the lid and the jar is what we call a ground glass joint. It's very smooth and tight fitting. So that's why it's so expensive. But inside here you have your unknown solid. Now sometimes we don't follow the procedure. Sometimes we modify the procedure to make things faster. And so in this particular experiment, um, The way it was written, it was designed for old balances. You know, the old balances had a limit to what you could tear. Do you guys know what tear, tearing is in the tear button? What does it do? It uh, zeroes the balance. You push the tear button, or the zero. Some, sometimes it's labeled zero, sometimes it's labeled tear. In the old balances, you couldn't tear or zero a very big mass. And so typically, what you had to do is, in order to weigh out a sample, um, one of the, the techniques that was used was to use a weighing bottle. What you'd do is you'd weigh the weighing bottle plus your unknown here, and then tap out some sample, however many grams you want. Let's say you want one gram of sample. You tap out one gram of sample, and then you cap this and reweigh it. And so the mass before and the mass after, the difference is the mass of the sample. Right, you subtract the two masses. But that means two weighing steps just to weigh out one sample of, of unknown. And so we've got to weigh out three samples of unknown. We're going to do three trials, each trial with a separate <coughs> quantity of unknown into three beakers. <coughs> and so um, we'd have to do six weighings. Six weighings is too much. You know why? 
Uh, six windings is too much because now with these modern day balances, I can put a 600 milliliter beaker there and tear a 600 milliliter beaker, which is you know, a couple of hundred, 300 grams worth of mass, zero it. And so now with the beaker zero, I would just get the weighing bottle like this, take off the cap, tap some in, and then recap it. However much I need. Let's say I need one gram. What happens if I overshoot it? If you overshoot a little bit, that's okay. Right? A little bit. You know, it's hard to get right on one gram. Very hard. And so we don't try. We just get anywhere near one gram. In fact, all you have to do is you have to get within 20% of the target mass. So if the target mass were one gram, that means anywhere from 0.8 grams to 1.2 grams is acceptable here. And so you don't have to fiddle around with this too much to get right on one gram. It's not worth it. And so if you got, let's say, your first sample, well, it's, one gram is probably too much. We're probably 0.100 or something. Let's say your first sample were 0.9852 uh, grams. Let's, we're going with one gram. Is that within 20% of one gram? Yeah, so this is okay. Am I going to tap in a little bit more to get it right on one gram, or is this good enough? Oh, that's good enough. And the next sample, 1.023 grams. Is that good enough? Or should I get a spatula and try to pick out 0.023 grams worth? No, that is enough to three zero grams. We, we're four decimal places here. These balances, well, let's say I go with 1.3896 grams. Is that close enough? No. Uh, unfortunately, this one has to be redone. It has to be redone because you have way too much sample. Way too much sample means you need way too much of everything else, like beaker volume. Maybe a 600 is not big enough. You have to go to a 1,000 milliliter beaker. Do we have any 1,000 milliliter beakers? No, so you end up splitting it into two 500 milliliter beakers. And pretty soon you're mixing double beakers for everything. You start running out of room. And so we don't want to go too too high, um, nor do we want to go too low, like 0.5893 grams. If we're at 0.5893 grams, that's too low. You know, too low means it's easier to detect things in large quantities, right, or high concentrations. Much easier to detect than in trace quantities or trace concentration. So what you're doing is you're hurting yourself here by going low, and so we want to target around there. And so we'd redo those and, and get that. And so the procedure might say weigh out one gram plus or minus 20%. The, the observations would tell you exactly how much you weighed to as many sig figs as possible. Right? These aren't exact numbers because these are measurements. Measurements are never exact. But we got a lot of precision here because of our balances. How much precision do we have in our balances? Our balances read, you know, when you tear this, it'll read 0.00, 0, 0, 0, 0 actually maybe triple zero point zero 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 grams. In terms of precision, you know, this is the this is called the tenth of a gram. You know, one decimal place is a tenth of a gram. Two decimal places is a hundredth of a gram. A hundredth of a gram is called a centigram. And so the balances in Chem 4 are measured to the nearest centigram. The balances in Chem 1A are even more precise. This is a thousandth of a gram or a milligram. And then we go to one ten thousandth of a gram or one tenth of a milligram. And so we call these balances a tenth of a milligram balance because they have a precision of a tenth of a milligram. And so we should have four decimal places in all our weighings. To get a tenth of a milligram balance costs a lot, costs you a lot of money. You know, um, these aren't cheap balances. When these were bought new a decade ago, they were five thousand, and so they're probably closer to ten thousand dollars now. And so treat them um, delicately, please. But the tenth of a milligram balance poses other problems. 
One problem is um, if somebody walks by the balance, you know, these balances are so sensitive that little wind currents with people walking by will cause the mass to fluctuate. And so the whole thing is encased in a box, uh, the balance pan, whatever. And there's two sliding doors. There's one sliding door on the right and one on the left, so whichever your preference is. And so what you do is you open the door, you place your object away, and then you close the door. Um, for us, uh, we, aren't gonna, we don't care what the beaker weighs. You know, we care about how much unknown we get in that beaker. And so rather than doing two wings and then subtracting those, we do one wing. And these balances are capable of, of, of tearing a 600 gram, or not 600, 600 milliliter beaker, like 300 grams or something. And so we put the beaker on here and then zero it. And then uh, we get our sample and then just tap it in here. But the pro the, another problem with a tenth of a milligram balance is a tenth of a milligram balance can weigh fingerprints because each time you touch something, you leave a little bit of residue, fingerprint residue there. A fingerprint residue can be a tenth of a milligram or more. And so when we weigh objects on here, we make sure we wipe our fingerprints off. You know, for the beaker, it's okay because we're just gonna zero it. So even if it has fingerprint residue, we aren't going to worry about it. Just go ahead and then tap in our sample. All right. Um, let's see. Was that it? Oh, yes. Our unknown sample, you know, has to be dried. Uh, why dry? Um, it turns out that if you look closely on the surface of this powder, you know, this powder is an ionic salt. And um, it, it's going to have some kind of structure like this, where we have a cation anion, cation anion, like this. And this structure, let's say this is a crystal here. So I got my crystal. Um, this structure is called what? Molecular structure? Ionic lattice. This is an ionic lattice. And on the surface of an ionic lattice are ions. And if, you, if you're approaching the surface of this, you notice negative, positive regions on the surface of the lattice. Now, there's water um, in air, you know, unless the air is dry, completely dry, but it's pretty humid, especially since we are close to the ocean. And so there's some humidity. And if there's water in the air, then um, sometimes those water molecules can strike the surface of this and bounce off. Sometimes they can strike the surface if they aren't moving too fast and get stuck. And so if this water molecule gets stuck on the surface, what's holding it to the surface of the crystal? The, the powder is a finely divided crystalline solid. You know, the crystals are very tiny, a lot of surface area. But what's holding a water molecule to the surface of the crystal? Well, what type of force is most important in chemistry? Electrical. So we have electrical forces. Electrical forces are going to be generated because water has uh, delta plus and delta minus, you know, partial negative, partial positive charges. And so the positive charge is going to be attracted to the negative charge here. And what we're going to get is we're going to get surface waters absorbed onto the crystal surface here. You don't see it because the crystals look dry, but they really aren't dry. They have some surface moisture. Not only that, in some crystals, you know, in the spaces between the ions, the water molecules can get in there and form what are called hydrates. 
Have you heard of hydrates? Hydrates look totally dry when you look at the crystals, but inside the crystal network, the lattice of ions here, inside some of these spaces, water molecules are going to be found, like in the pores of a sponge. And so um, here, what we want to do is we want to get a consistent mass. We don't want the mass to depend on what's the relative humidity today. You know, if the relative humidity were 100% every day, we had the same humidity, then no big deal because it's always going to be saturated with water. But if the, if the humidity fluctuates, then that means the mass of this is going to fluctuate also. And so to get a stable mass, what we want to do is we want to drive off all the water from this. And so, in other words, what we're going to do is we're going to take these dry looking crystals or powder and dry them in the oven. And so, um, the day before, uh, in fact, the day before is tomorrow, the day before Thursday, uh, the stockroom people are going to put the unknown samples in the drying ovens, which are next door. They're going to be heated to about 120 degrees C or so. At 120 degrees C, that should be enough kinetic energy to drive off any surface waters and any waters absorbed into the crystal structure itself. And so we get rid of those waters of hydrate and surface absorbed water. And then we end up with dry crystals. The dry crystals should have a stable mass. Dry crystals are called anhydrous. And so we got to um, we got to dry these. So we remove the lid and then put it in the oven with the lid and uh, dry them overnight. And then you get your sample. When you get your sample, you take it out of the oven. It's going to be very hot. Since it's very hot, 114, you don't want to touch it because that could give you like second degree burn. So you're going to bring a plate like this. This is a ceramic plate for hot objects. And a pair of um, tongs. You could just use your crucible tongs. Crucible tongs. So you're going to get this from the drying oven, and with your tongs, you can just hold it steady so it doesn't fall over. But the problem is, what happens to this sample? You know, it's going to have the lid off. The lid is actually going to be on the bottom of this. Here, put that in. Okay, what happens as it's hot, so it's going to keep the water out, but what happens when it cools down in humid air? It's just going to reabsorb water, right? And so we can't let it cool down in the open lab. We have to um, let it cool down in a water-free environment or a water-free atmosphere. And so how do we get a water-free atmosphere? We use this. This is called a desiccator, and a desiccator has desiccant in here. Desiccant's like calcium sulfate. Calcium sulfate's hydroscopic. Have you heard hydroscopic before? It's water loving. As calcium sulfate forms a hydrate. And so what we do is we put in anhydrous calcium sulfate, no water, and then as the water in here hits the calcium sulfate, it gets absorbed and stuck. And so basically what this does is it desiccates the air in here or just dries the air. And so we have dry air inside here. Calcium sulfate doesn't have an unlimited capacity. Um, you know, there's a, calcium sulfate's white, but there's an indicator that we add to some of the crystals, which is blue. When it's blue, it's dry, but when it turns pink, it's it's wet. Even though the crystals don't look wet, that pink color tells me those are wet crystals. And this calcium sulfate is, or this desiccant is no longer any good. But that's okay. I don't have to throw this away. Do you know how I can regenerate blue desiccant? I just throw this in the oven, drive off the water on the surface and the water in the crystal structure, and I get anhydrous calcium sulfate or dry calcium sulfate again. And so as long as um, this has been sealed and the air in here has been in contact with this for some period of time, this is, should be 0% relative humidity. 
so what we're going to do is we're going to put our hot sample in here. And so you got to take the lid off this. But if you look here, I'm going to just hold the lid. But do you see the lid doesn't come off? Don't, don't try this in case it does come off. You don't wanna, these are very expensive. But um, here, uh, the way, it's because of the vacuum, the way to break this lid off is just to slide it off the fingers. So you can just slide it off and then take it off. But do you want to leave this open for very long? No, because humid air is going to get back in there. And so we only take the lid off quickly uh, to put our sample in there. And so what we're going to do is we're going to remove the lid, place our sample in here. What about the lid? Should I put the lid in there too? Yes, I need to put the lid in there. Because even though the weighing bottle looks dry, this weighing bottle, in fact, might not be dry because do you know glass? A lot of glasses contain ions and a lot of glasses contain polar, you know, dipole type bonds. Um, and so the, the glass, even though I don't see it, the surface of the glass is saturated with water molecules from air. And if this were uh, like really sensitive chemicals I was working with, in which I needed a, no water around at all, then I'd have to dry the glass as well. And so they have drying ovens for glassware too. You do that. But we're not going to worry about that um, too much. What we're going to do is we're going to put our weighing bottle with lid in here. When you put the weighing bottle with the lid, you put the lid down first and then put the weighing bottle on top of that because we need to fit, we don't have very many of these desiccators, so we need to put three or four samples in here from different people, from different groups. The problem is, is it's hot, and so hot air expands, and so if you put the hot crystals in here and then seal it up, as it cools down, the air in here is going to contract and create a very uh, strong vacuum, and it's going to be hard to break this, and with that vacuum, a lot of air is going to get sucked back in here. And so what they ask you to do is they ask you to leave a small gap in there initially when you put this in and then it'll cool rapidly, and then shut it. Oops, here. There's grease on this. This is a ground glass joint here too. It's very smooth and forms a very tight seal. Okay, so um, it, it tells you to leave the lid ajar for I think five or 10 minutes, but that's too long. We should just leave the lid ajar for, <coughs> almost broke one of these. We should leave the lid ajar for maybe three minutes, that should be adequate. And so the procedure might say, leave the lid ajar for 10 minutes, but I think 10 minutes or even five minutes is overkill. And so in your observations, you write down only three minutes. And so that's the difference. The procedure is what you're supposed to do according to the instructions. The observations are what you actually did. Did you follow the procedure? Exactly, or did you deviate slightly from it? And everybody deviates slightly because it's too much of a pain to weigh out exact amounts. You can just get it close enough. All right, then we seal this and let it cool for another five to ten minutes. It should be plenty. But what happens after it's cool? We got to take it out, right? You can't just leave it in the desiccator all the time. And this is the nice thing about a weighing bottle because a weighing bottle has a lid. And so right now we have dry air trapped in here. And so what you got to do is you got to make sure you cap it with the lid. Like this. And so now we can take it out. Okay, it's capped. And so when you weigh out your samples, what you do is you remove the lid, tap in your sample, and then replace the lid quickly. What I see all the time is this. You know, in the lab, I'll walk by or look, and then somebody has a lid laying here and the jar open like this, and they're doing something else. You know, obviously, they don't want to understand the concept of desiccant, desiccator, right? It takes time to de desiccate that air. And the same thing over here. You know, I'll go inside the balance room, 
And then I'll see somebody is uh, writing something down, but you know, here's their sample here, and here's the lid here. And so they, they have their lid. In other words, they have an open weighing bottle of unknown sample. What are they doing? You know, what was all that work from drying it the day before, doing all this desiccator stuff, and now they just leave their sample open to humid air? And so whenever you remove the lid, you try to replace the lid as quickly as possible to minimize the error. It's in there. All right, so this is a start for a Thursday's lab, a little bit of a pre-lab discussion. Any questions about this? No? So what are we doing today? We're doing uh, three things, three things. We're, first thing is we're going to learn how to um, pipette using a 10 milliliter more pipette. A 10 milliliter more pipette is like a burette. You know, there's a line here that says zero and a line here that says 10. In a burette, there's a line here at zero and a line here down here at 50. And so a burette has a manual valve like this, which we can um, turn on and off the flow. A pipette doesn't have a valve here. You have to control it using your thumb or your finger here. A lot of people say don't use your thumb, but I find the thumb.